Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We need everyone to be quiet, please. All toys put away. Everyone focusing. All right. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ba'd. All right. So we left off at section 19. And who remembers which surah we're on, by the way? Everyone? Uh, Ali. What's that? Ali Imran. Okay. Very good. And uh, what was the surah before it? Yes. Baqarah. Very good. So there are 20 sections in Surah Ali Imran. And I was thinking, you know what? Maybe we can try and finish 19 and 20. Seems like a good idea before Ramadan because there's going to be no class in Ramadan. Then when I looked at how many verses are left, I realized it's not a good idea. So we're just going to do 19 and we'll finish the rest, inshallah, section 20. So when we finish section 20, we have one more after today. We have one more class in order to finish Surah Ali Imran, but we'll do it after Ramadan is over. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a kahoot, which actually does a summary of the entire surah so that you can review all the stuff that you know. Okay? Inshallah. So, let's get started with section 19. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, we'll skip the recap for today. Yeah, we were going to do it, but we'll skip the recap for today. Inshallah. وَلَقَدْ سَمِعَ, لقد سمع اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِن Allah has surely heard the words of those who said, Allah is poor and we are rich. So there was a group of people uh, among the Jews who were living in Medina. And one of them made this statement and they said, Allah is poor and we are rich. Imagine how horrible of a statement that is. To say something like this, to say that Allah is poor, and this is horrible. This is a horrible statement. Now, who is saying something like this? Why were they doing this? So there are three main tribes inside the city of Medina and around Medina. There's a tribe known as Qaynuqa. There's a tribe known as Qurayza. And there's a tribe known as Nadir. And the ones who were the closest at this time were Qaynuqa. And there was a, tri a group of, they're all Jewish tribes. And so what happened was that when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to Medina, the first thing he did was he started meeting with all the non-Muslims. And the non-Muslims were either, either idol worshippers or there were Jews living there. Very few Christians, very few atheists, very few of people of any, no, no Buddhists or anything like that. These were the two main religions there. So what did he do? He met with the idolaters and told them, hey, you guys should stop worshipping idols and only pray to Allah. He had a meeting with the Jews and he would send them letters. So he sent a letter to the tribe of Qaynuqa and he invited them to Islam. And he said, you guys should become Muslim. I am the messenger of Allah and you should become Muslim and accept Islam. And then he said, and you, when you do that, I'm also asking you to check for your sincerity that you're really genuinely becoming Muslim. I'm going to be asking you to donate to the cause of Islam because the Qaynuqa were very rich people. They specialized in two fields. And it's kind of funny because when you hear it, you're going to say a lot of Jews in the world today, they still specialize in these two fields. They specialized in money lending and they specialized in goldsmithing, right? making jewelry and things like that. So they had a lot of wealth. So the Messenger of Allah also tells them, you should accept Islam because it's true, I'm a prophet of Allah and you should donate to the cause of Islam and what he did was he quoted a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, which we've seen. If you kept on, if you kept coming from before, Surah Al-Baqarah, what chapter is Surah Al-Baqarah in the Quran, by the way? Does anybody know? Hamza, two, number two. So chapter two, verse 245. It says, who will loan to Allah a nice loan? You guys remember this verse? So this means basically when you donate and you give charity, to the masjid or to the poor or to the cause of Islam for some reason, it's like you're giving a loan to Allah because what it means is the money that you give, you don't just lose your money. A loan, when you give someone money, they're going to pay it back to you, right? So when you give money in charity for the cause of Allah, Allah's going to pay it back to you. When? On the Day of Judgment. He's going to pay you back, but Allah pays you back with interest. Remember, we talked about that. Allah's allowed to give you interest going to give you extra money. He's going to give you so many rewards because you're going to get paradise. So whatever money you're giving, it's your ticket to getting closer and closer towards paradise. 
So the prophet quoted this verse and he said, you know what? Give some of the money that you guys have if you're going to accept Islam genuinely and give some of the money that you have to show that you're sincere in becoming Muslim. So you know what the response of one of the leaders of the Qaynuqa was? He said, Allah wants us to give him a loan. People who ask for loans are poor. That means Allah is poor because Allah wants a loan. So he made this statement. He said, Allah is poor and we're rich. We have so much money. That's why they're asking us for money. Now imagine how horrible of a statement that is. And all the other people around him, many, most of the people, they started laughing. And they said, ha ha, that's so funny. Now look what Allah is saying. Allah has surely heard the words of those people who said, Allah is poor and we are rich. How many people actually said it? One person. How many people laughed at the joke? A bunch of people. And Allah put them all in the same category. Because if somebody says something bad and you laugh at the joke and you say, ah, that's so funny. It's just like as if you said it. It's just as bad as you being the first person to say it. And you can't be like, well, I didn't say it. I just laughed at the joke. No, it's not funny. It's very serious. So Allah is putting them all in the same boat and saying, Allah has heard what those people have said. We will write down what they said and their killing of prophets unjustly. So he says, we will write, Allah says, we will write down what they said. Meaning when Allah writes down something, I mean, Allah never forgets anything. Meaning it's going to be written down so it reminds them that, hey, we're not forgetting this. We're, this is going to be remembered. This is such a big statement. Don't think you can just get away with it and be like, oh, it's not a big deal. Sometimes people make statements and they're like, oh, I think I got away. It's not a big deal. No. Statements, the more serious they are, they're, they don't just disappear. They're very, very serious. And also their ancestors killing of the prophets unjustly. So now what it's doing is it's going back and it's talking about something in the past. And we've seen this in Surah Al-Baqarah before. Is that there were people, like we've seen most of the prophets that are mentioned in the Quran, did most of their people believe in them or disbelieve in them and reject them? Which one? Yeah. Disbelieved in them, rejected them. Most prophets are rejected. Some prophets, not only were they rejected, they were killed by their own people. And who were some of the people who killed their own prophets? Among the children of Israel. They were some of the people who killed their own prophets. So Allah is bringing this up and saying, you guys said this, we'll remember this. And your ancestors who you keep boasting about, you know, you talk about the bloodline, we're Israelites, we're from the children of Israel, we're from the special tribe, we're special people. So you know what, those people... We remember that they killed their own prophets without any justification whatsoever. And the type of people who would kill the prophets that, that were sent to them are the type of people who would make statements like this. This is how serious of a statement it is. So it's tying the two of them together and saying, you know what, your statement is so bad. It's like one of those people who would kill the prophet. It, that's, the, that's the level of insult that you're making when you make the statement. <laughs> We will say, taste the torment of burning. So Allah is basically saying that when we're throwing them in the hellfire because of these statements that they made, we're going to say back to them, now here, in, enjoy this hellfire that you're about to be thrown into. So what was their statement? Oh, Allah is poor. Allah says, that's what you said? We know what you said. Watch what we say on the day of judgment when we decide to punish you. That's, gonna, that's what's going to happen. So this is the response back that Allah gives to people who are making fun of Islam and making fun of the Prophet. This is the reward for what your hands have done. What is your hand? What does it mean your hands have done? Your deeds. Any bad deed that you do, your hands represent your actions. Sometimes you can do bad deeds with your, your feet. You can kick somebody, you shouldn't kick them. You can do bad deeds with your mouth. You know, you can do bad deeds in so many ways, but usually most of the things you do in your life has to do with your hands. So hands is just a, a, a wording for all the things that you've done. So that punishment is the reward for the things that they had done in their life. Allah never wrongs his servants. So Allah reminds them. Somebody looks at that and says, oh no, they're going to be put in hellfire? That's very serious. That's so bad. But Allah reminds them that, you know what? 
when Allah makes a decision, He's not doing it like randomly. Allah is never going to wrong anyone. And it reminds them that whatever punishment Allah decides to do, it's to whom? It's to the servants. So Allah is in control. And it reminds people that, hey, if Allah is in control, then you know what? He can he he can do whatever he wants to his servants. And when he does it, he does things justly. So they deserve this because of what they did. Allah doesn't randomly punish people. Sometimes in life, people will treat you badly and you don't deserve it. If Allah punishes you, it's because you deserve it. It's because you did something really, really bad. And Allah is describing one example of these people. الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَهِدَ إِلَيْنَا أَلَّا نُؤْمِنَ لِرَسُولٍ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَنَا بِقُرْبَانٍ تَأْكُلُهُ النَّارُ Those, basically those are the same people, those type of people who said that, they're the same ones who say, which is not correct though, but they say, Allah has commanded us not to believe in any messenger unless he brings us an offering to be consumed by fire. So this is something they got from their own book. In the Torah that they had with them, the slightly modified version of the Torah that, by the way, which prophet brought the Torah to reveal to? Somebody raise hands real quick. Anybody know the Torah? Who brought the Torah? Uh, yes. Huh? You're guessing, Musa? What's your second guess? Harun's second guess? What's your third guess? It's Musa, anyways. Your first guess is correct, right? So, all right. So, Prophet Musa brings the Torah, and in that there's a verse. Even today, you can read what the Jews have that with them today. It's in the book of Leviticus, chapter nine, verse twenty-three to twenty-four. It talks about that whenever a charity is going to come. One time, it happened that somebody donated something in charity. It was an animal. When they donate an animal in charity, they put it in like a special place. And a fire came down from the sky and consumed, basically like kind of cooked the animal or burned the animal or something like that. And this was a sign that the sacrifice was accepted. This was like a miracle from Allah. So what happened was there was this idea, almost like a superstition among the Jews, that the way, the, the only way that, um, you know, uh, sacrifice can be accepted, if, if this sign happens, if it comes down, then it's guaranteed that the sacrifice will be accepted. But of course, this only happens to prophets. Right? This, this is a miracle from Allah. So they're saying, Prophet Muhammad, we cannot believe in you because you're not a true prophet. Why are you not a true prophet? Because our book, the Torah, which is from Allah, teaches us that we're not allowed to believe, we as Jews cannot believe in any messenger unless he brings an offering, like an act of charity, like an animal given in charity, and it's consumed by the fire. The fire comes and consumes it to show that it's been accepted. So there needs to be, we need to see a miracle of this happening. And so far, Muhammad, we have not seen this from you. You have not brought this type of miracle. So what's the response? They're giving a justification. Why Why can't we believe in you that you're, you're a real prophet? So the response is, Say, the Prophet is being told to respond back to them. Other Prophets actually came to you, even from your own tribe, from the children of Israel, before me with clear proofs, and they even came with what you demanded. So which, who was one of those prophets? Prophet Suleiman. Prophet Suleiman had many miracles, and this was one of the miracles. So the response now is, that sign that was in your books, that already came. So there's like a, there's a prophecy in your book, and another prophet already came that you were already believing in anyways. Why are you applying this prophecy to somebody else? It's like, for example, it's like saying, you know what? We will not uh, accept you, Prophet Muhammad, until you are able to uh, cause a dead person to come back to life because we've been told by Allah that a prophet is going to come and he's going to be able to take a dead person and by the miracle of Allah, bring that person back to life and he'll be able to cure somebody who's blind and he'll be able to cure somebody who's a leper. Which prophet did that? Prophet Isa. So if they go to Prophet Muhammad and say, you know what, we can't believe in you because we haven't seen those things. Your problem is you didn't believe in Prophet Isa. Because the Jews don't believe in Prophet Isa. 
But a prophet was already sent who did those miracles. So the Prophet Muhammad doesn't need to do those miracles. That was a prophecy that applied to a previous time. So that is the response. And then he says, and why did you, meaning you, like your people, your tribe that you are so proud of, why did you kill them then if what you're saying is true? If you really care about them, why did you kill some of those prophets in the past? Right? So this is the response back to the Jews from the Qaynuqa tribe and some of the other Jews around Medina at the time. فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ فَقَدْ كُذِّبَ رُسُلٌ مِّن قَبْلِكَ If you are rejected by them, then so too were messengers before you. So the Prophet Muhammad is being told, if they reject you, then you know what? They were prophets and messengers that came before and they were rejected too. You're not the first person. And that that's comforting. right? That's, that's not like the... It doesn't feel great that, oh, so many prophets were rejected before. But like, imagine you fail a test and you, you worked hard and you didn't pass the test. And somebody comes and say, you know what? Some of the best students that were ever in this school, this test was so hard that some of the best students, they failed this test too. But then it was okay. They, they retook it and they ended up passing. You know, some people, you fail your driver's license test the first time, right? Or you fail your driver's permit test the first time. I'm not going to ask you in case that happened, right? Some people do. And imagine you feel so horrible. You feel miserable. You're like, I'm such a fool. I... Am I, am I foolish? I can't even pass a simple driving test. Am I that, you know, unsmart? You know, what do I do about it? You're feeling horrible. And you say, you know what? They were some of the most brilliant and clever people. If somebody says, you know what? Albert Einstein failed his driving test too. And then you're like, oh, really? <laughs> supposed to be a pretty smart guy. And he, and he failed too. Then you start feeling a little bit better. It's exactly like that. So the Prophet Muhammad is being told, if you're being rejected by them and they're making fun of you and they're not accepting Islam, then you know what? You're not the first person who's ever been through this. Many messengers have been through the same thing, so don't feel so bad. They came with clear proofs. So even those prophets, they came with clear proofs. They came with miracles. They came with divine books. Here the word zubur, from zabur, it means divine books, not zabur of prophet. That would, divine books and wal kitab al munir and enlightening scriptures. In Arabic, it's singular linguistically, but it actually has the meaning of plural. They came with the Torah. They came with the gospel. They came with many books. Who? We just said uh, somebody else. So who brought the Torah again? Anyone was paying attention and did not forget everything in the last three minutes? Uh, yes. Prophet Musa, excellent. Alhamdulillah. Who came with the gospel, the Injil? Jabir. Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus. That's right. So it's saying, you know what? All these other messengers came, they brought books, they brought miracles, and they were rejected too by a lot of people. Don't feel so bad because it happened to them too. So you're going to be all right. like, it's okay. Don't feel so bad. You're going to feel bad naturally. Your people are not accepting you. But just know that it's happened to other people. It's not about you. It's the message they have a problem. Don't take it personally because it happened to other people in the past. Every soul will taste death. Meaning, every person will die. Every person, every human being has a soul. And everyone's going to die. There's not a single person that can live forever. And Allah reminds us this many times in the Quran. Some people, they want to live forever. Some people are tricked into thinking, I can live forever. I'm going to figure out some scientific experiment where I can freeze my body and... I'll just like be in a frozen state and they can bring me back in like, you know, somehow bring me back to life. So today in like, I think in Arizona, there's like hundreds of people who paid like a million dollars. When they died, they had their body frozen. It's called cryogenics. They put them in a laboratory and they're still sitting, their dead body is sitting in a laboratory in a frozen capsule. They're like in a massive ice thing. And they're saying, we hope that in the future, doctors and scientists can like do research and come up with a way to bring our bodies back to life. And they're paying from their money that they left behind. They're paying every month to keep all the electricity and like keeping them frozen and everything. like. That. They're trying to live forever. Even if somehow they could figure it out, right? Allah can end the world at any time. He can cause like a, a meteor to come and crash into the earth. The whole earth explodes. That ice does nothing. For you. you're, you're still dead, right? You, could get a, you can get a disease and an illness while you're sitting in a capsule and you'll die. Allah can kill you in so many different ways. So no matter what people say, oh, look, I, I cheated death. I wasn't able, to, I, I survived. I didn't, you know, die. Allah can kill you in any way, shape, or form. And he's saying every single person 
is going to die at some point. You cannot live forever. You will only receive your full reward on the day of judgment. So meaning that all the stuff that you do in this life, you're gonna get it, you're gonna, you're gonna get all the reward or the punishment in the next life, all the good that you've done, because the prophet was just being told, right? You're being sad. You're sad because people are not accepting you. All the reward, this is this is some sadness in this life. Sometimes there's a lot of sadness in this life. But all the right responses to the test that Allah sends your way, you're gonna get the full reward on the day of judgment. Full reward. Meaning. What about the other part of the what about the other part of the rule? You get some rewards in this life too. You're not going to get all the reward in this life, but you're going to get some, but your full reward is going to be on the day of judgment. Whoever is spared from the fire and is admitted into paradise will have victory. They'll have success. Right? So that could be being spared from the fire initially. Meaning never having to touch the fire, which none of us want, even for a moment, or after a short punishment because they're a true believer and they did some bad things, and part of their being forgiven is that they have to be punished for a little while and then taken out and put back into Jannah. Even that moment will be a type of victory because nobody wants to remain in the hellfire for eternity. The life of this world is no more than a delusion of enjoyment, right? Meaning all the pleasures that you experience in this life, it's a delusion. Delusion means that it's kind of like a trick. You see nice things and you see good tasting cookies and you see like all sorts of things that you enjoy in this life. But basically Allah is saying, compared to Jannah, this is like, it's almost like a trick. It's, it's such a small little thing that you get, it doesn't compare at all. It's like a mirage. You look at a mirage, you look far away, and you see like it looks like there's water, the desert. But when you get closer, you're like, there was nothing there. You felt good for a little while, like, you're like oh, there's water, I can see it, feel it. But there's, that's not real water. So that's kind of this life. Allah is saying this life is a, an enjoyment, but if you compare it to the next life, it's nothing. You, the primary thing is to get to Jannah and to be safe from the hellfire. You will surely be tested by Allah in your wealth and yourselves and your lives basically like Sometimes you're going to get sick. Test from Allah. Sometimes you're going to get injured. That's a test from Allah. Sometimes you'll people will die. And you'll be sad that someone next to you that you love died. That's a test from Allah. And you'll surely hear many hurtful words from those who were given the scripture before you and from the idolaters. So you need to be prepared for that. That's what it means. So there were three major religions in Medina and kind of around Arabia. One of them is the idolaters. Id idolater is somebody who worships idols. And then there were the people who were given the book before you, the scripture before you. Who are those people? The Jews and, to say, and the Christians. Three major religions at the time. So it's saying, you know what? These three groups, which are like all the groups in Arabia at the time, you're going to hear some really hurtful words. Previously, the prophet was being spoken to. And they're going to say some really bad stuff about you. In the Before that, they were saying bad stuff about Allah. So first they were saying bad stuff about Allah. Allah is poor. Ridiculous state. Then they said bad stuff about the prophet. We can't believe in you because you didn't bring a sacrifice where the fire is going to consume. Now the believers are told, they're going to say some really hurtful words. And you're going to hear it from the Jews. And you're going to hear it from some Christians. And you're going to hear it from some idol worshippers. Everyone. All the religions that are there at the time, they're going to say some bad stuff to you. So why is Allah telling you that? You prepare yourself. It's not going to be perfect. Life is, you know, you, you can't go around expecting that no one's going to say anything bad about Islam. If you live your life that way, what's going to happen? The first time someone says something bad, you can be like, I can't believe they said that. Urgh, how dare they say that about Allah? How dare they say that? You get so mad. 
But if you prepare for it and you say, you know what? There's some bad people out here. And like in my school, there's some really messed up people. And they're going to say some horrible things about Muslims and about Islam and about the Quran and about the Prophet and all that. And if you know there's going to be some people like that, then when you hear it, you'll be like, yeah, you're one of those people. I, I knew there were some people like that. You just happen to be one of them, right? It's like what's happening today, even what's happening in Palestine. There are some really bad people out there. They have no care about the life of anybody. They have no sympathy at all. And you're like, but all Jews are not like that. That's true. All Jews are not like that. But some Jews are like that. And then you encounter one in the street and you say, no, no, we're in a different time. We're in a peaceful era and we have constitution and we have secularism and there's separation of church and state and we're modern people and we're civilized people and we eat with knife and fork and we're so nice. And then you encounter one person and they're like the most despicable person you can ever meet, the stuff that they're doing. And then you're like, people have not changed that much. That's exactly what Allah was warning us about. And yes, you're going to see people like that. And when you prepare yourself mentally and say, you know what? There's people like that. It's not going to bother you as much. If you have the right expectations about this world and you have the right expectations about people, then it's not going to bother you as much. If you have the wrong expectations, everyone is just so nice. They would never say anything bad. And then something bad happens. You're like, oh, can't believe it. Can't believe they would do something like that. Allah is saying, be prepared. You're going to hear some bad stuff. From all these groups. So be ready for it. But if you're patient, you don't respond, you don't let it get to you, you don't make bad statements or comments, and you're mindful of Allah, that is a great accomplishment. That is something really big, meaning you're going to be rewarded by Allah for having that patience. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ لَتُبَيِّنُنَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَكْتُمُونَهُ Now Allah is speaking to the Prophet. Saying, Remember Prophet, when, we took, when Allah took the agreement of those who were given the scripture to make it known to people completely and not hide it. So remember when the Jews and Christians received their books, of the Torah and the Gospel, and the, the Imams or the Sheikhs of that group, what were they told? They were told that your job is to teach this to the people. Don't hide the parts because you don't like it. Allah revealed this. Some of these verses, I don't like these verses. They don't suit me. Like imagine today. Imagine today somebody has the Quran and they're like, can you teach this uh, new Muslim some Quran, please? And you're like, sure. But you like drinking alcohol. So you're like, I'm just going to skip those verses. We're just not, we're going to pretend like they're not there. There's like white out in your copy of the Quran. It's like all erased, you know? And you're like, yeah, yeah, here, here's your Quran. You like erase those parts. You can't do that. Your job is to convey the message completely. So this is what they were doing. And Allah is reminding the Prophet that this is what they were told to do. But they threw it behind their backs and they traded it for a small price. Throwing it behind their backs is basically means like putting white out over. Right, you erase those verses because in the past, the books were not just in one binding. Books were in several volumes, small, small little volumes, and they were all stacked together. Even, you know, many large books, they didn't have like giant bindings because the binding would be undone and it's too heavy and big paper. So they were in small, like little folders kind of with papers inside. So what this means is the ones that you don't like, with the verses that you don't like, you take that little folio, portfolio, or whatever, and it's as if you're hiding it. It's like basically someone saying, hey, can you give this to me? Sure, here's my holy book. And you take one, and you like throw it out, throw it over your back. Now, here you go. Here's the entire book. And what did you do? You concealed part of it. So it's like they threw it behind their backs, and they traded it for a small price. Why would they do this? Because it had something to do with money. So let's say somebody, for example, is selling alcohol. They sell beer. And you say, oh, if people find out that this verse says that beer is haram, you can't drink alcohol, you can't drink wine, and this is what I sell, I'm going to lose money. Take this one, this page, rip it out, throw it behind your back. Here's the book. Here's, here's what it is. Why? Because you wanted to make some money. So this is what people would do. They would conceal some verses because it had to do something to do with their money or their business or whatever it was. And Allah is saying, you paid such a, like, you got... Such a little amount, whatever money you got, let's say you got a million dollars. What do you get in exchange for that? 
hellfire. That price that you got is not worth it. That's a horrible deal. I mean, how much, how much is it worth it? Like if you were to ask someone, how much money is, is it worth to go to hell? If you said, you know what? You agree to go to hellfire and we'll give you this much money. What amount, what amount would you give? Would you be like, one million is enough? One billion is enough? No. no amount. Nobody would say, if anyone saw the hellfire in front of them, say, hey, look, here's one billion dollars. Here's one trillion dollars. You're the richest person in the whole world, but you're going to have to go into the hellfire. Actually, forget the hellfire. Here's a living fire just in this world. We're just going to light a giant fire. I'm going to give you one trillion dollars if you go and you stand inside that fire just for one minute. Do you think anyone would do it? Nobody would do it. Nobody would do it. Because it's not worth it. No price is worth it. So it's, this is exactly what Allah is saying they did. What a horrible profit that they thought they made. Because it's in exchange for the hellfire. Do not let those who are happy with their bad deeds, I mean people who are like, yeah, I'm doing bad deeds, but I'm okay with it. I don't feel bad. Don't think those people and the people who love to take credit for what they've not done think that they're going to escape the punishment. So there's two groups of people. Some people, they're happy with their bad deeds. They do bad deeds and they're like, it's okay. It's not a big deal. And then there are other people who like to take credit for something they didn't do. So somebody comes along and says, MashaAllah, you brought me a cookie. Thank you so much. That's so nice of you. Oh, you know, I love to be generous to other people. And this is not your cookie. It's actually my cookie. I, I made this. Right? You didn't bring it, but you take credit for something that somebody else did. Somebody puts away the chairs. And you go, you know what? somebody didn't see who put away the chairs. You put away the chairs? That's so nice of you. Thank you. You know, I try to help out whenever I can. And you didn't do anything. So basically Allah is saying, those people who are really bad, they love to take credit for things they didn't even do. That's such a horrible quality to have in your life. And they think they can escape the punishment? No. They will have a painful punishment. And the last verse. Only Allah owns the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. Basically, Allah controls everything that happens because to Him, he, He's the one who's in control of everything. Allah is able to do anything. Meaning if He wanted to punish those people or the sinners who've been doing bad stuff, at any time He could do that. He can punish them. Right? Yusuf. All right, so he can punish them at any time he wants to. So be careful. People who are committing sins, people who are doing, praising themselves for something that they didn't do and all that stuff, be very careful because Allah just gives people time, but he actually controls everything. And he can take back anything whenever he wants it. All right. Are you taking notes or are you drawing Kind of drawing, yeah. Close that. That's not the best time to be drawing right now. Can we close that? Thank you. All right. So, Allah is able to do anything, right? So He, we need to be very careful and remember that we have to do what is right and what is pleasing to Allah. All right. So we'll open up the kahoot, inshallah, and then we'll take questions, inshallah. So while we're loading the kahoot, I'll take some questions. But everyone needs to be quiet and whispering. Okay. Isa, what's your question? The Torah is the book like the Quran that was revealed to Prophet Musa. Okay. Other questions? Yes. All right. So we, we need we need no everybody. Nobody should be talking. Everyone needs to whisper while they're getting into their group so I can hear the questions. Okay. Just, just, just let it go. Yeah, yeah, let it go. Okay. Um, the Quran is a book that's like the Torah, right? So, guys, this is not working because everyone's still talking. Yeah, people are still talking. Yusuf, you're still talking too. Okay. So, 
the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, the 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 Injil to Prophet Isa, and the uh, the Torah to Prophet Musa, right? So these are different books with different, slightly different content, content but similar styles. So the reason why he didn't reveal the Quran is because the Quran was not suitable for that time. So Allah reveals the message to the Prophet for his own time. Okay, inshallah. Any other questions before we start the Kahoot? Huh? Blick it. Oh, so we're doing Blick it today, inshallah. All right. Blick? Blick it. Blick it. Blick it. We're doing Blick it. I just learned this new today. All right. All right. It's a little bit different. There's three modifying variables rather than Kahoot has only two modifying variables, which is cool. So, are we ready? Okay, yeah, inshallah. So, Sayyid will explain how to use this. So, you just see the question, see what the answer makes most sense to you, you click on it, and then you just rack up points. And it depends what role you're going to choose. So uh, that, that's how we're going to do it. So uh, it's on your own. It's the correct answer. On your own page, you don't wait for anybody. You just wrap the points until we're <laughs> over. Okay, about how, how much time do they need to start loading? Okay, so everyone start loading. Yes. Okay. Okay, we got two groups so far. Okay, 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 good. That's better. I'm assuming that's a halal pig. All right, who's still who's still loading in? Who's still logging in? Quick, let me get him. Log in. Scan the QR code. All right, we'll give you twenty seconds. Okay, and huh? Thirty seconds more. Okay, inshallah. Okay, Hamza is generous, mashallah. Can you can you help this team real quick to yeah to, yeah help this team to get on having some problems. Mention what? Okay. So there will be instructions coming up as we go along, inshallah. Ready? They're ready? Okay. Let's go. Three, two, one, go. Oh, wow. Okay, getting started. Dragon Bright just took ten crypto. I'm curious to know. Oh, I can't even. Oh. The questions don't display. Only on their side. Oh, okay. Okay. 
तो कुछ So we can't see the questions at all. Oh man. Uh, I, they can see, yeah, yeah. But Kahoot, every, everyone can see that, the questions. Uh, top three, Michelle. All right, where is Light Vault? Who's Light Vault? Who's first place? Your light vault? Oh no. Who is Light Forge? Light Forge? Okay. Who is Iron Collar? Okay. Inshallah. Pretty good. Who is Light Pedal? Light Pedal? Oh, okay. Mashallah. Pretty good, man. Doing good. Oh, this is yeah, by a lot. 16,000. Pretty good. 16.3k of How do they get so many points? That's a lot of points, man. By guessing passwords? How do you hack that? How do you hack it? 49,000, man. That's a lot. Huh? That's what it seems like. I'm just supposed to get like 248,000. All right, for the audience, next time we're going to stick with the uh, Kahoot because everyone can see the questions. <laughs> this is the, uh, yeah. Not for the people who don't have a phone in front of them. <laughs> yeah. I see it. Maybe, maybe Sheikh Omar Suleiman will be at ICOI. <laughs> maybe. We're, we're working on it right now. This Friday. Uh, this. Huh? I know. He's here right now. In He's going to be here tomorrow. So he's in town for a Yaqeen retreat. In 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 Orange County. Private private event. Not public, but so he has no khutbah this Friday. No. We're not gonna fly. Text me Friday morning, I'll let you know. He's got like a million, man. <laughs> I you, like, All right, 50 seconds to go. He only does one. Oh, smart No, 30 seconds from the top. I'm a fellow. I'm no writer. Oh. Three, two, one. Okay, there we go. Let's see. Soul Singer, Light Forge. Who's, who's Emerald Rider? Who is uh, Light Forge? Light Forge? Who is Spell Singer? Who is Spell Singer? MashaAllah, nice. All right, inshallah, first place gets four cookies. Second place gets three, third place gets two, and everyone else gets one, inshallah. I don't know. I didn't even know how it worked. All right. We'll see you after Ramadan, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.
They're coming. All right. Stick with COVID from now on. 